Mr. Christensen, the floor Thanks. is yours. Thank you. My name is Don Christensen. I've written five books, but I've never won the Pulitzer Prize. But amazingly, uh, I did research at the library, and Ms. Spot was helped me, and we really never met until this moment oh, in yeah. any other case. I you believe look very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you worked on the second floor? That's right. I believe that's also where Barack Obama went to find a job. Uh, okay. No, at the Job Information Center, when he had uh, left Columbia and he was looking for, for a job, yeah. um, uh, he uh, went to the Job Information Center at that time. It was on the fifth floor. Oh, the fifth floor. Yeah. I'm sorry. And look where he is now. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it worked. Anyway, besides writing these books, for which I did not win the Pulitzer Prize, uh, I've worked as a researcher in an area that we, you could call corporate intelligence. In other words, people would hire me to find out about other people, about other corporations, everything that you can find. Well, I took that, those, that type of research skills and that perspective to this situation. And I did it primarily by reading through the papers of the former director of the library during the years of the formation of the Mid-Manhattan Library. Uh, his name was John Mackenzie Corey. Do you remember him? Oh, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. He was on the staff of the library from the early 1950s until the late 1970s. All of his papers covering the transformation of the Mid-Manhattan building from the department store known as Arnold Bo Constable are preserved in a large file box in the manuscript department of the main library building. That collection of papers includes all the correspondence, personal memos of everything from telephone conversations to notes gathered at lunch meetings, copies of internal reports from various trustee committees, copies of legal interpretations concerning the Mid-Manhattan property as a real estate investment, as well as various white papers and confidential reports that define the sequen of sequence of events and thoughts that show the path for the development of the facility. The records of directors of the library are sealed from public view for 20 years. That means we won't be able to access such records of the current director and those of the recent past to find out exactly what they have been up to for another 20 years, in which case it might be too late. But we have Mr. Corey's papers and they reveal a lot. When I went through these papers, I took copious notes and had copies made of salient documents. Unfortunately, I cannot share with you copies of those documents. I have them here with me but I cannot copy them or quote from them for any type of publication, including the 20 copies of this testimony, without permission of the library. I have not been able to secure permissions, so I will have to paraphrase what I found in those papers. Okay? There are two basic issues I'd like to cover today in a short amount, a short amount of time as possible. First, the goals and intentions of the Mid-Manhattan Library as defined by the people of John Mackenzie Corey's era, Corey's era in comparison to what the current regime wants to deliver to the people of New York. Second, to look at the Mid-Manhattan property as a piece of real estate. As everyone in this room knows, this whole current plan is really a real estate story, apparently designed to, sit, to make someone really, really rich while impoverishing the cultural and intellectual texture of the city of New York. First, why Mid-Manhattan was developed. Since the late 1940s, the library wanted to move the small circulating facility out of the main lot building so that the main building could concentrate on the research aspect of the library that was the basis of its formation as opposed to the goals of the branch libraries. First, they considered other ways of expanding the space within the main library. For example, there was a plan drawn up to tunnel under the terraces surrounding the building. That plan was scratched because they wanted a general circulating, general research library that was both visible and easily accessible. They did not want to hide it within the marble fortress of the main library. Also, they wanted a facility at a location nearby the main library. The idea was that if someone's research was beyond the resources of a general research library, a patron could readily be sent to the main library and have their research needs handled immediately. In 1961, the, the building housing the Arnold Constable department store came on the market. The department store did not own the building and never had. That sto the store was just a tenant, and in 1969, they had a lease that would not expire until 1979. Still, the library bought the building with the specific intention of taking over the building in 1979. Uh, 1979. But the department store went out of business in 1975 and vacated the building. 
In 1967, the department store vacated the top three floors of the building, and the first manifestation of Mid-Manhattan Library Branch opened on those top three floors in 1971. After the department store completely vacated the building, a series of recommendations were made about how to use the space. There was a lot of pressure to rent out the first floor for commercial use to get money to run the library. But a stronger faction within the library argued that such a thing would go against the goal of making the library fully visible from the street and readily accessible right off the sidewalk. To make it even more inviting, they increased the size of the windows on the facade of the building so that people could see in and see that it was a welcoming place to enter. After the commitment to the Mid-Manhattan, to, to its street-level open, open, openness and easy accessibility, millions of visitors have found that the concept has been very successful. Now we are faced with a different idea. This idea strives to hide the general library deep in the bowels of a formidable building behind three massive walls of marble and far, far away from ready access from the street. This idea more closely matches the idea of burrowing under the terraces that an earlier and wiser generation of library leaders rejected as inappropriate for serving the general public. And how will this hidden facility welcome people into it or even let people know it is there? I doubt very much that they will put a sign over Stephen Schwartzman's name on the building to tell people what they could find inside. As far as accessibility goes, this plan is a nightmare. I counted how many stairs and how many strides it would take to get to that location. Now I might point out that it takes about 10 strides at the Mid-Manhattan Library to get from the street into the actual library space and it's on one level. In contrast, you have to climb 29 stairs and you have to take 62 strides to get from the sidewalk to the first door of the building's entrance. Then you have to take another 88 strides to get from the first door, traveling through two more doors, to finally get to the top of Sir Norman Foster's flamboyant and vulgar staircase, to look up at a seven-story high empty atrium, and then climb down more stairs to reach the level of the so-called library. It would take a half a day to get to and from that space, and only if you're in good shape. But before you get to Sir Norman's atrium, you would, ha you would be forced to pass through one small door to get into what is now the Gotsman exhibition space, and then another small door at the other end of the Gotsman space before finally you're getting to Sir Norman's staircase to begin your descent. These two small doors supposedly are to serve both as ingress, ingress and egress to and from the atrium space. At the Mid-Manhattan Building, in contrast, there are three doors to enter, and in different locations there are five doors to exit, and even then there are sometimes lines to get in and out. But Sir Norman's design doesn't take such traffic flow into consideration. The library has produced a video that shows how easy it would be to get to Sir Norman's atrium by seeming to show you floating through these little doors like Peter Pan with no other people around and no obstructions. Have you seen that video? Yeah. In reality, it would, be, it would more likely look like the army of cards in Alice in Wonderland slamming up against each other to get through the white rabbit's little door. <laughs> when I look at the lack of doors to accommodate any reasonable type of ingress and egress flow of people, I notice that there are spaces at the rear wall of the Astor Hall that separates the hall from the Gotsman Exhibition Hall that could be knocked out and more doors put in. Although the Astor Hall has an interior landmark status, I understand that that landmark definition does not extend to the back wall. I wonder if the current leaders of the library and Sir Norman would have any problem with knocking out portions of that wall and vandalizing that space once they realized that people couldn't get in and out of the single small door that is there now. Certainly the distance from the sidewalk to Sir Norman's atrium would be an insurmountable expedition for a lot of people who currently use the Mid-Manhattan location with ease, and that doesn't even begin to address the needs of disabled people. Will people in wheelchairs be sent on an excursion to 42nd Street and up and down ramps and elevators instead of simply traveling directly off the street like they do now at Mid-Manhattan and how the people of Corey's era wanted it? In short, we are we are getting, what we are getting here is the closure of a completely open democratic space and in its place we're getting a hard to get to and hard to access area that re that's really designed to keep people out for elitist use by who people who have the time to get there and the knowledge of where it's hidden. And let's be frank here, 
Who would look, who could look at that huge atrium space and not see it for what it really is? A dramatic party room to be used occasionally by a handful of rich people. All fully equipped with a Sir Norman staircase to enter onto and sashay down so that the party goers gathered below can admire the clothes of other rich people. Mm. The successful and ideal profile of the existing mid-Manhattan building as fulfilling the goals of being a visible, accessible, democratically welcoming center located right on the street compared to the hidden, inaccessible, elitist nature of the proposed plan to move within the main building butts up against the reality of the real estate of the mid-Manhattan building. This prime property is ripe for development, but who would get it? Who is posed to make the big money with its ownership? But more importantly, why should the library give it up, since obviously could, they could never be able to recapture such real estate if the nature of libraries change again at some time in the future? Plus, considering the library's past failures in successfully getting good prices for the real estate they have already sold, why should they be trusted now not to throw this one away as well? The unique placement of the Mid-Manhattan Building finds it at the edge of the Bloomberg Initiative calling for the updating of buildings within what is called the East Midtown Rezoning Target Zone. I have a map there for you. On that map are shaded buildings that, are, that were built prior to 1961 and are particularly targeted for replacement with more modern and taller, taller buildings. You'll see on the map that the building directly adjacent to the Mid-Manhattan Building to the east is one of those shaded buildings, 10 East 40th. The Mid-Manhattan Building occupies 2 through 8 East 40th. The library building itself is not within the target zone, but again, the adjoining property is. 10 East 40th is owned by a group headed by, a real, by real estate mogul Larry A. Wall, W-O-H-L. Wall's father and Wall's father's partner, Norman Levy, bought 10 East 40th in the mid-70s. The two, the two buildings, the library building and 10 East 40th, have a long and complex interwoven history that's too complicated to get into here, but they share various spaces. The two buildings were built by the same man, Frederick Vanderbilt, who owned them until his death in 1938. There are aspects of the two buildings that overlap because, and I can tell you a little bit about the heating system, for example, for many years, and maybe it still is that way, the heating system for the library is actually located in the basement of number 10. So there was an interconnection. Because of this interwoven connection, Norman Levy and Wool's father were in constant contact with John Mackenzie Corey and other library executives over one matter or another affecting both buildings. Then in the mid-1970s, after the department store decided to vacate the building and before the commitment was made to fully develop the mid-Manhattan branch, Levy and Wool made a very serious offer to buy the building. This sent the library leaders to assess the situation seriously. They drew up an analysis of six options, including selling the building to Levy and Wool. The library, as well as the whole city, was in dire financial straits at the time. You must remember what it was like in the mid-70s. If you're old enough, you can remember it. But in the end, the library leaders took the high road. They recognized that the building offered the best and unique option for the goals they wanted to achieve to serve the needs of General Library, they turned down the purchase offer to follow the ideals of the institution, visibility and accessibility no matter what the cost, even though they didn't really have the money at the time. Obviously today, if 10 East 40th could be a target for demolition and replacement with a super skyscraper, then a building that could occupy both 10 East 40th and the mid-Manhattan building site would make that super skyscraper even more super. I doubt that that observation has escaped Larry Wohl, and he has the money to do it. In addition, Mayor Bloomberg has apparently jumped on the tear down the mid-Manhattan building bandwagon. A attached to this testimony here is an agreement from 2008 from the mayor's office allowing the library to vacate the mid-Manhattan building and sell it. This so-called agreement looks more like a commandment than an agreement since no one from the library signed it. Has the observation of linking the two properties of Mid-Manhattan and 10 East 40th escaped the notice of the current leaders of the library? I doubt it. 
but would they stick to the principles that their predecessors under the leadership of John Mackenzie Corey showed when they turned down an offer of ready cash from Wool's father in order to fulfill the goals of the institution of reaching out to the users of the public library by having a space visible and easily accessible. Sadly, I doubt that as well. I don't know if Larry Wall has been taped maintain the type of constant contact with today's li library leadership that his father and Norman Levy enjoyed with John Mackenzie Corey. We won't know for another 20 years when we will be able to examine the papers of Mr. Marks and his advisors. But the other day I got a little clue. Walking past the two buildings where they join on East 40th, I noticed that a large advertising sign for Mr. Wall's leasing corporation, Joseph P. Day Realty, was announcing space for lease in 10 East 40th. The sign extends far into the side of the library building, and I have photos of them for you. This sign, in other words, encroaches on the library property apparently with impunity. Is Mr. Wall already assuming ownership of the library building? Are the leaders of the library already assuming that that will be the case. Is it much of a leap to imagine how much richer Wool will become with control of that corner of real estate? And is it much of a leap to imagine how much access, less access the people of New York will have to library services as a result? Thank you so much, Mr. Christensen.